Welcome to our webinar series for professionals. Welcome everyone to this webinar where our uh, one of our favorite uh, presenters, Umao, is going to entertain us with his amazing knowledge in regards to genetics and uh, the new DNA core report that we have uh, gathered. So I've known Umao, well, let me, not not quite since Let the Force Be With You, but... <laughs> close to, yeah, close to something like that. Yeah. But nearly, um, like uh, in, internally, you can hear Umao is a Star Wars uh, fan. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, so Umao and I have been going on for a long time, um, working with functional medicine and going to conferences. And Umao, I love when Umao educates, there's always something new. Um, and he is he's amazing in um, communicating very like uh, technical biochemistry and like making it into something that we understand. But when we leave the meeting, we are all a little bit more confused and we are like, wow, where has, has he got that knowledge from? So we all I'm always a little bit like intimidated, feeling that I'm not good enough. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I continue learning and um, I, I guess you are the same. And we yep. reached the 108 now, just so that, <laughs> so we met, we did it. <laughs> well done, Umao. And uh, so what we have, uh, what I have up on the screen now, hopefully you can see my screen, is that we are doing an event in London on the 26th to 28th of April, where uh, Umao will be educating. We sent out a teaser and, and a mail about it just today, um, uh, about two hours ago, I think it was, if you're checking your mails, where there's a link to sign up and prices and early bird prices, etc., And also <clears throat> a lot more information about uh, yeah the event and the other speakers as well because it's not just tomorrow talking there's other speakers as well so it's going to be a grand event and um, we are of course looking very much forward um, to it and I hope to see you there and then uh, in between that we have on the 18th of April a free webinar again which is on the Dutch test around menopause and perimenopause uh it's a very hot topic at the moment it just gets hotter and hotter that topic somehow so I, we thought it was a time to to invite a specialist in on that topic for sure so i will just now stop sharing my screen and then um umao let you take the stage on the setup now is that umao will do his talk you can do questions and comments, etc., in the chat box and chat room. I will try and take notes if there's something that I think is relevant to bring up at the end of Omao's presentation, where I'll just spend a little time um, on Q and A then. So, and please connect with each other and reach out. And um, yeah, I'm really, really thrilled. We are 133 now on counting. So that's very, very nice to see. Umau, I'll mute myself. So uh, here you go. <laughs> Take Thank the stage. You. Thank you. And uh, I'm glad to have so many people with us uh, from all over the place in different time zones and uh, locations. And so... I'm going to present initially a really strange case that makes no sense that even had the Danish National Diabetes Center baffled because they really couldn't figure out what was going on. And then all the answers actually turned up when we did the genetics. So I'll start with that, then we'll see after that and in terms of questions, how much time is left. And then I have plenty of other interesting cases and uh, tidbits to go through to look at some of the, how, again, this notion how genes interact with environment and how sometimes figuring out the genetics then will help you understand why patients have problems that are otherwise inexplicable, you can't explain, or why they don't respond as you would expect to interventions, be that interventions you've set up, help them do, or just interventions they've tried on their own when they do things that should work. So let me show you here. So we look going to look at a case of really strange type 2 diabetes in an otherwise healthy patient. And I know that's a bit of an oxymoron because like, 
okay, if he has type 2 diabetes, how in the world can you say he's healthy? And it's a he, uh, by the way. But when you see the details, then you'll see, yeah, actually, this is, at first glance at least, inexplicable, unexplainable type 2 diabetes in someone who shouldn't have it by any means. And this, of course, is a client, I, is a physical client I have in my, in, in my clinic and I've been seeing over several years. So it's a young guy. He's 33 years old, non-smoker, doesn't really drink alcohol. He's an accountant. So he's sedentary, but he's in quite good shape. And so he actually, um, I mean, he still like would move some on a daily basis, but whenever he would go and play football or go for a run, he was still in really good shape. So although he didn't do sort of structured sports, when you looked at his physical fitness level and fitness tests, everything was fine. And uh, also, yeah, he had a high workload, but he wasn't clinically stressed. So accountant, quite successful, um, right? And he certainly said, yeah, he, he wasn't getting enough sleep, uh, partly because of work, but also because he has several small kids and they're lovely, but they are just going to chip away at those uh, hours of beauty sleep you need. He also eats a relatively healthy diet. So he actually gets enough vegetables, fruits, and berries. Uh, he's definitely getting not just 600 grams, but more than that when we did a food di diary. And he, his, you know, the animal protein he was eating were pretty healthy sources, lean meat, poultry, eggs, um, protein-rich, low-fat dairy products, that sort of thing. Most of the fats he would eat were healthy fats as well. Um, you know, olive oil, almonds, olives, other cold pressed vegetable oils. And he would have a bit of butter and, and, and a bit of cream and things like that, but nothing that much. And then you know, two, three, four cups of black coffee. And he had a pretty low intake of refined carbohydrates and processed foods. And also he, he was taking multivitamin, mineral and fish oil. I mean, so just when you look at that, I mean, you wouldn't expect someone like this to be a type two diabetic. Right, just on lifestyle and general behavior uh, and background. Um, back in the, so initially, this starts all the way back in 2018, six years ago. So during the fall of 2018, he started feeling off. Like he couldn't really put his finger on what, but he felt tired. And he did actually also uh, urinate a lot more and was thirsty, but no one really thought. Because usually, of course, okay, if someone starts urinating a lot and is really, really thirsty, you might think, Ah, diabetes, right, or type 2 diabetes. But for him, no, because his body composition was also stellar. So he wasn't fat, he was skinny fat or anything like that. But he had these things. He started having frequent infections. He'd get the cold, he'd get the flu, a sore throat, ear infection, and so forth. And he also sometimes would have headaches and edema as well, sort of kind of unexplainable. And then he was tired, had joint muscle pain and, and blood work. Because then when he felt bad and went to the emergency room, they'd oh, his electrolytes would be off sometimes. Sodium would be high, sometimes it would be low, sometimes his potassium would be high, sometimes low, and his chloride as well. So you know, so, so something's going on here. Uh, and then he, because he had a, a check, you know, in a, back in 2017, uh, HbA1c, right, at 37 uh, uh, millimoles per moles, which is something like 4.5, 4.6%, 4 which is normal. And then, of course, this should have had anyone raise their eyes, think something's wrong, because then he had another health checkup done, just as a routine checkup in the summer of 2018 with his uh, HB1C. So it goes from 37, which is in the ideal range. If you use millimoles per mole, you want to be between 30 and 39. 48 or higher is diabetes and 44 is prediabetes. So he then has actually, he's prediabetic, in the summer of 2018, but his GP didn't think anything of it because, like, well, you're lean, you, you, I mean, you're sedentary, but you know, then if you go for a run, you do well. If you play football with the guys, you do well. Uh, you choose to go cycling or hiking, whatever, and you have a really healthy diet, and you're not skinny fat either. And then they finally measured this HbA1c again after he started having this off period in the fall. And so it went from 45 to 119, which is really, really high. Usually when you have people who do have sort of a straight up obesity, uh, visceral fat, too little movement, too much food, too much crappy food. I mean, getting an HB1C of 119, which must be what, 10, 12% or more, right? That's, I mean, it, it wouldn't happen. Uh, 
And also he's running a elevated fasting and post meal glucose. So his uh, at this time when they finally pick up on it, right, he has a fasting glucose of somewhere between 6.7 and 8.2 millimoles. You want to be lower than 5.6 when you're using millimoles per liter uh, and 6.1 or higher is pre-diabetes, 7 or higher is diabetes. So he runs there and his post -glu meal glucose would go as high as 16, which is also massively elevated when you're using millimoles per liter. You really don't want to go above 8.5. But I said, no one really expected that to be type 2 diabetes. That's also one of the reasons why, it, I mean, why didn't they get him or catch him or pick up on it? Even though, of course, the warning signs should already have been there in the summer of 2018 with a hemoglobin A1C of 45. So it's gone eight units up over the course of the year. But again, because he was lean and healthy by most means, and when you did all this other words, work like lipids and things like that, nothing was really, there's nothing there. Um, so initially for treatment, and this is before he consulted me, he was offered metformin. And then it's kind of the usual dietary advice for someone with type two diabetes, go low on saturated fats, eat high fruits and vegetables, eat a lot of complex carbohydrates and eat quite you know, many smaller meals to stabilize your blood glucose. And then he attended a lecture I did and said in the intermission, he came up to, you know, I'm really at a loss here because I have this type two diabetes and um, like, it doesn't make sense from my lifestyle, from my body composition. Uh, when I'm offered metformin, I'm not really sure I want to take that. And, I'm not really sure if the dietary advice given uh, is, the, is the right advice either. I mean, like a carb-rich diet, why in the world would you want that? Um, so I said, and, and all, by all this other blood work was normal. So like total cholesterol, LDL, VLDL, triglycerides, all nice and low, HDL, nice and high, right? So there any other things off. So I said, okay, I think we're going to put you on a kind of low-carb uh LCHF food, but not, not a bacon, cheddar, uh, butter, coconut oil with pork rind LCHF. So we said, okay, lean sources of, of protein. So, you know, poultry, uh, tofu, tempeh, fish, lean, cuts of red meat, game, that sort of thing, and focus on monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats, but from whole unrefined foods. So not margarine or cheap grapeseed oil or anything like that, but olives, avocados, guacamole, extra virgin olive oil, and then put him on a relatively high protein diet and then say, okay, non-starchy vegetables, you can eat as many as you want. Uh, and then uh, starchy vegetables and berries, you can add in in amounts that won't exacerbate your fasting and post-meal glucose. Because also we wanted to have quickly see what, you know, what, what, how far did we have to go to get his uh, glucose under control. And so Actually, and said, you know, so go for a fasting of no more than 5.6 millimoles per liter and post meal, we want to get you at 8.5 or lower. And then three meals a day, not many small meals, nothing else. And then you're going to have water, tea, and moderate amounts of black coffee. Also, okay, we're going to have to get some movement in, right? Because we know for glucose dispersal and glucose metabolism, movement is essential, even though, I mean, he did, he, as I said, he wasn't in a regular exercise program, but Still, when, whenever he did something, he was in quite good shape, right? So it wasn't deconditioned, but it was still going to have to do that. So have you do more trans sport, not as in sports with all this, these discussions about biological gender, self-perceived gender, but as in make your transportation movement um, half an hour more. So he started biking to work rather than taking the car. And also he would have his kids um, and put them in a large... We have these Christiania bikes and then these large bikes with like a almost like a cargo compartment in front where you can actually sit multiple kids or the rest of your family they can sit there so he'd use that so in the morning he would bring them to school and then bike to work and then he would go and pick them off after work so we simply incorporated movement as part of his daily going back and forth not on something on top of what he had to do and then I said okay most days I want you to get some sort of high intensity training in no more than say five ten 12, 15 minutes, so something that will actually fit within your life because you're busy as an accountant, you have several kids and family obligations and you're getting them to and from school and sports and swimming and acting class, whatever, uh, but we're going to need to get movement. And then, of course, some sort of de-stressing. Again, he wasn't stressed as such, but he had high workload and demanding work. So we also added in, okay, 
every single day spend 5, 10, 15 minutes meditating, breath work, whatever, and then prioritize sleep. And at initial session, at the session with me, we said, okay, his weight, 69 kilograms, 1.76 meters, BMI of 22.2. So see that, I mean, that's why his body composition actually was quite good. And it might have been a bit higher with the BMI and body fat before that when he you know, met me in the fall of 2018, but not much. And, and body fat in terms of, so for a male, 14.8, perfectly fine. And the waist of 80 centimeters for men, you want to be less than 94 centimeters, right? But the, his challenge was that when we put him on that diet, he would actually lose lean mass. So he said, you know, I've, I've, I've lost a bit of body fat, but I'm also losing some muscle and I'm hungry all the time. And everything else was perfect. But you see, we, we did get him uh, way better, right? So we did bring him, I mean, his... Uh, HbA1c from 119 to 49 to 37 uh, within time by having this lots of movement and also pretty aggressive dietary intervention, not a no-carb diet, but any sort of concentrated starchy foods and all refined carbs totally gone. Um, and then uh, his uh, fasting glucose also started changing. So his fasting glucose now happened to hit a maximum of six millimoles per liter. So we actually got him out of the diabetic and pre-diabetic range. He had normal post-meal glucose and normal electrolytes. So we actually, in some ways, we didn't manage to get him under control here. And then I said, okay, we'll put you on a broad spectrum potent multivitamin mineral. We'll put you on 75 micrograms of vitamin D on top of what you get from the multivitamin uh, mineral. And then because he was eating plenty of fatty fish. Some calcium uh, as well, because he didn't really eat dairy foods, fish oil, and magnesium. Uh, and said, okay, continue with this LCHF, and then try to see if you can eat small amounts of slow carbs. Keep up with the daily movement, and then to stall the loss of lean mass, with, uh, instead of having high-intensity interval training every single day, said, okay, we're going to have to do some whole body strength training two, three times per week, and then have high-intensity interval training most other days. And then just to be sure, give him some chromium as well, because chromium obviously can have an impact in terms of uh, insulin functioning. Creatine to stall his lead loss of lean mass and inositol as well. Now, most of you probably have heard of inositol in terms of PCOS, right? So PCOS, inositol sometimes helps because amongst other things, it improves insulin signaling. So the insulin resistance glucose load part of PCOS can partly be managed with uh, inositol, but that also means all your clients that have type two diabetes, pre-type two diabetes, or this glycemic of insulin resistance, you might want to consider adding inositol because it works as well for them as well. And in fact, I know there's someone in the audience uh, today who also, uh, who doesn't have type two diabetes, but who, uh, or PCOS, but who started doing inositol and has felt a, a significant improvement in their blood glucose levels and blood glucose management. So we, we did all these things and because we, okay, well, so we need to find a long-term solution. How can we keep you steady? And then I said, okay, we're going to monitor you. So in, on blood work uh, with your GP, we want your vitamin D to be at at least 180 nanomoles per liter. And if you want to convert to nanograms per deciliter, then you divide it by 2.5. But ideally, we want you in the 120 to 140 range, so like 50 plus nanograms per deciliter. Magnesium upper half of normal range because magnesium is obviously important for glucose handling as well. Zinc important as well. Just you know, uh, so we 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 want we'll cha change your supplements to make sure we reach these targets that the inositol can't measure. So just keep you on that dose. And then we had a follow up in September two thousand and nineteen. So he kept up with his with the plan in terms of diet and training. Uh, Strength training two times a week, running two, three times a week, daily movement, body fat down to 10.5. So now we're getting to something that almost would be look like a bodybuilder or not yet. I mean, they're lower, they're in single digit fat. No increase in lean mass. So he, we stopped stalling his loss of muscle, but he did have an increase in strength. So we're, you know, he's in a better, way better situation there. And for his lab, we see his fasting glucose actually came back really nice at five millimoles per liter, except he noticed on days when he was ill and wasn't able to train or have that daily foundational movement, then his blood glucose would actually get back up into the sixes, so pre-diabetic range. Um, 
And we could see in terms of vitamin D, okay, we hit the spot. The zinc, despite getting a multivitamin mineral and eating zinc-rich foods was less than ideal. Uh, it's magnesium we had. And then we look at his uh, lipids. And so his total cholesterol constantly was anywhere between 3.2 to 3.4 millimoles per liter. LDL between 1.7 to 1.2 and HDL between 1.1 and 1.8. And his triglycerides always lower than 0 0.9. And so again, if you go from European units to units used elsewhere, I mean, total cholesterol, you want less than five. LDL, you want less than three. HDL, you want above 1.1 or 1.2. And triglycerides, they're really good. They're less than 1.1. So you see no dyslipidemia whatsoever. And that's what I had that rechecked with his GP, but also when we went back and looked at his blood work previously. And that's probably one of the reasons why previously, his, you know, back there in 2018, why wouldn't his GP expect type 2 diabetes? It's like, well, I mean, your lipids normal. Okay, that sort of body fat, low waist, circumference, that sort of thing, no way in the world to have type 2 diabetes, except that initial HbA1c of 45 really should have had alarm bells going off, or at least should have been kept, they should have kept a closer look on that, especially with an eight point increase over a year. And so we said, okay, we're gonna continue this healthy LCHF diet and also maintain physical activity, training and movement and continue their supplements, increase zinc, because he was actually clinically deficient in zinc and managed to zinc and vitamin D to optimize. Now, then we have a follow-up September last year. So he actually is just off on his own for a while. And I thought, okay, everything must be good since he didn't come in for a follow-up. Um, and then he said, well, yeah, he managed to keep his blood glucose under control until about 2021. Uh, but he kept on losing weight and having really hard time maintaining or especially gaining lean mass on the low carbohydrate, high fat diet, uh, healthy fat that is, and high protein diet of all the movement. He also he said he felt hungry and tired at times. So after his blood glucose actually started increasing a little bit until 2021, but when I then sort of, you know, questioned him a bit more, I said, well, actually during that time, I also moved less, right? So he said, first he said, the, the LCHF diet, for some strange reason, didn't work any longer. I said, well, but what about movement? Then we went back and looked at his, you know, what he'd been doing and looking at tracking his activity. He actually moved less. So initially he thought, well, I'm going to go completely plant-based because everyone tells you plant-based is good. So he did that for a year, year and a half from 2022 until 2020 or 21 and 22. But his glycemic control just deteriorated. And then he thought, okay, I'm going to go full coder, keto, for, and he did that for one and a half months in the spring of 2023, but no effect on blood glucose. So he was full keto, but he still had now elevated blood glucose levels and HbA1c. And when he was full keto, he was tired to the point that he couldn't keep up all that foundational daily movement or training, right? So, so he also said, okay, I'm not going to do any of that. Now, one thing to also consider is he did actually have both COVID-19 and also had COVID-19 vaccines. So a question is whether some of that deterioration in 2021 might actually also have been due to some sort of immunological disturbance um, caused. But but the other thing is, as I said, that his movement actually did decrease, uh, especially during COVID, because then the kids were at home, right? They, they weren't in school all the time. He wouldn't go for work. So that hour or more of daily sort of foundational movement due to external circumstances went out the window, he still would train every day. Um, and, and but he didn't really, it's not until later in retrospect, he figured out ah, that's probably of what, what happened. And then he tried these other dietary variants. But again, you'd imagine someone with a body fat of 10.5, that waist circumference, normal blood, I mean, normal lipids, normal blood pressure, why in the world would they go into the pre-diabetic range or kind of the diabetic range on a plant-based diet, not a shitty plant-based diet, but like lots of legumes, whole grains, you know, so there's something else going on. There's something under the surface, even initially, why would he you know, get into such a bad state? So his glycemic status, when he then saw me, uh, started consulting me again uh, fall last year, right? HbA1c in his mid fifties, uh, and that's when he was actually on metformin and slow acting insulin. So imagine that someone who 
is that lean he was still moving not as much as we said initially but he was back in the type 2 diabetes range despite them going on metformin and then also being given slow acting basal insulin um and his actual glucose levels throughout the day were extremely variable anywhere from 5.2 to 10.7 which is definitely too high and he noticed that it would increase after meals and then whenever he trained or did movement he would actually lower his glucose from 10 to about 5.5 after you know about half an hour a bit more of movement but it's also it's very time focused like because even if he kept up lots of movement overall he'd still have these spikes and his c peptides persistently at 400 to 500 so it also shows he wasn't having this you know you sometimes have people get this kind of type one and a half diabetes, they're type two, and then at some point their pancreas starts setting out. So he's, you know, so he has normal insulin production, but he still they gave him insulin. Uh, and so medically, right, he was put on the max dosage of metformin, 500 milligrams four times a day, and then anywhere from 12 to 18 units of slow acting basal insulin every morning, which also helped him put on lean mass. So when he started the insulin, he actually put on Two, three, look at two to three kilograms of muscle. I actually said you might, which we still haven't. Uh, this GP hasn't agreed to that, nor the diabetes sensor, steno diabetes sensor in Copenhagen. You might try to add an all GLP one agonist as well from the medical perspective to manage his glucose. Um, and now his body count came back, so his waist went up, but again, it's perfectly normal. You want to be less than ninety four centimeters. His weight increased somewhat, right? But his body fat still is not elevated, so. It's also how in the world if his body fat related that his body fat went up by 4% and his waist circumference went up, how in the world would they explain that as obesity driven in someone who's still rather lean, right? It, I mean, there's something something not really making sense here. I said, okay, you're going to go back to the LCHF diet, but it's the salmon, avo, almond, tahini, extra virgin olive oil, LCHF, three meals per day, nothing else, um, and then water carbonated water, green and white tea, herbal uh, tea, and some black coffee, and then also have some proper cinnamon with every single meal. So cinnamon, when you get, I mean, with cinnamon, you have two types. You have cashew cinnamon, which is kind of the fake one, and then you have real cinnamon from Ceylon or Sri Lanka, and that, that's the type of cinnamon that actually has an impact on glucose levels, and that's the one that's not toxic. And then also at least try having stevia. Because there's studies suggesting that stevia might improve glucose handling probably through GLP-1, right? So stevia has a sweet taste. And obviously we have taste buds, not just in our mouth, but also in our stomach and in our small intestine that will notify, notice when things are sweet. And if they're engaged, if you have the taste buds in the mid part of your small intestine, they're engaged with something that tastes sweet, that will actually trigger the secretion of GLP-1, which will then improve glucose handling. I said, okay, we're going to try to put him on some uh, alpha lipoic acid with meals. Start lower, even go higher, because we go too high sometimes, people actually get hypoglycemic. And then some acromantium with cinephila, either live or postbiotic products. So Pendulum Life, one of the first, um, I don't have commercial ties to Pendulum Life, but they have acromantium products. And there are a couple of studies, with, if they're given both the live acromantia, but also if they're giving the postbiotic as in dead acromantia, it seems to improve glucose handling and it increases endogenous GLP-1 production. And then he'd stop taking an and say, okay, we're going to put you back on that. And then, because his GP wouldn't, I said, okay, we, I really like to run uh, zinc and iron and things like that again. So I said, okay, we'll do a hair mineral analysis. Not, I mean, there are certain things you have to be aware of of a hair mineral analysis, but to get an idea of what's going on, as you can see, he's actually rather low on chromium, also on molybdenum. Uh, and somewhat low in selenium and iron as well. Now, all of these, especially chromium, right, are being down here towards the lowest 5%, would also, of course, impact his glucose handling. And low selenium is also high selenium and low selenium both can cause type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance. Um, iron, because I wanted to have his iron checked because of that fatigue he experienced, but his GP says, well, since you're not anemic when we measure hemoglobin, red blood cells, there's, I'm not going to measure iron, but we can see here again, he's actually not that high on iron. Um, 
course, also that all that time plant based, he didn't get much iron. But even after been being full keto, eating lots of red meat, so there might be some malabsorption going on. And then we looked for heavy metals, and he did have mercury uh, and some uranium, which we have no clue where that's from. Uh, he doesn't work in the nuclear industry or any place like that. So I said, okay, so we're gonna have you on supplements, chromium, up your dosage, selenium for a while, because that was low. Have you do a more potent broad spectrum also in mineral? He just went back to the sort of average you buy in the supermarket. And then some NAC as well in chlorella, both of those because we saw that mercury, which might play a role, and then Junemna Sylvestre, which also can help getting give you better glucose control. And there's a you know this strange, inexplicable, unexplainable type two diabetes. I think we need to run your genetics because there might be something going on here. Uh, and they said the same thing at the Stino Diabetes Center in Copenhagen. There must be some strange genetic component going on here, because even we'll give you metformin and we'll give you insulin, and you're not obese by any means, you're not skinny fat or anything like that, and you're sort of relatively healthy in terms of movement and exercise. Um, but they did, but we don't know what test to run. So it's okay, we're going to do DNA core and see what comes up. And whoa, does he have markers for insulin sensitivity issues? A whole lot. Uh, and also certain micronutrient requirements and food sensitivity things as well. So, I mean, we'll go and look at those closer in a moment, right? But but especially if we start looking, okay, what's going on here with his uh, type 2 diabetes and this unexplainable type 2 diabetes or remission, going from remission and then remitting, uh, relapsing back to type 2 diabetes, not by going on a pork rind, McDonald's burger, chips, you know, fizzy, soft drink, milkshake diet, but just by not being completely strict with carb intake and not moving repeatedly throughout the day. Uh, and we also see there are certain nutrients, micronutrients he needs. Um, and then, so, ah, he also has some genetic for Seebeck disease, which is interesting. And there are some things in terms of weight management, but again, although he had some issues from genetic in terms of, of obesity, he's not obese by any means. And then we've got the exercise information just for the heck of it. Um, but look at his genes for type two diabetes and insulin resistance. He has a problem with pretty much every single SNP. And some of them, I'll show you some of them, especially this IRS one, which is a new one, might explain, and also is TCF7L2, right? So, because I mean, the only way you can see we can really control his type two diabetes is by keeping him moving a damn lot and moving repeatedly throughout the day after meals, keeping him not on a no carb diet. And in fact, if he had no plants whatsoever, that had his glucose go up when he went full keto, but on a rather controlled low carb diet, except of course that got us in trouble in terms of maybe supplying enough carbohydrates for maintaining lean mass, right? But he has multiple really unfavorable SNPs in terms of type 2 diabetes. So it's PPRG, right? He has a version there um, that could increase the risk of type 2 diabetes. Now, in this case, I don't think that's in play because when you have the thrifty gene variant of PPRG, that increases your risk of obesity, but he's never been at body fat higher than 14. So he's been perfectly, I mean, in the ideal range all the time, nor any type in science of him being skinny fat. We did have visceral fat measured as well. But then here, okay, so he has a TCF7L2 issue. Now that might actually cause an issue because that impacts the production of GLP-1. And I'm just going to, some of you have experienced me do this. I'm going to go draw some, um, right? But so here we start getting, uh, here might be some of the genetics that play a role. Um, and that's also why, especially when I saw this, I really would like him to try a GLP-1 agonist uh, and see what happens. But since I can't prescribe, I'm just a nutritionist and pretty nerdy and knowledgeable, then, uh, you know, nor, not, neither his GP nor the Steno Diabetes Center want to do that. But let me just... Get ready to draw some of this for you.
Here we go. So, TCF7 L2, transcription factor seven like two, right? Pretty strange name. Speaking of the Star Wars reference, it does sound a bit like R2D2, TCF7 L2, MCH4R and that sort of thing. But TCF7 L2 really has an impact on your ability to produce DLP1, right? And when you look at all these new drugs that they're for, and they're not new because I mean, they've been around for 10, 15 years, but I mean, all the new blockbuster drugs for managing obesity and type 2 diabetes, right? They're GLP-1 agonists. So what would normally happen if you have normal functioning is whenever you eat, especially when you have food that will hit the mid portion of your small, small intestine. So when you get... Um, past the duodenum, right? So like mid part, small intestine. Then the moment you start having all sorts of messengers here, messaging a high energy environment. So that would be fiber, amino acids, not Alcoholics Anonymous. Glucose and other monosaccharides um, released when carbohydrates are broken down, if they're you know, more complex carbohydrates. Also, when you have things that taste bitter. And also, when you look at certain gut microbial metabolites, then really what should happen is that you should have GLP-1 released from the part of your small intestine. And GLP-1, of course, then has quite significant effects on nutrient partitioning, on energy handling, on satiety and so forth, right? Because then as GLP-1 is secreted, it's going to tell your pancreas to increase its output of glucose, uh, not of glucose, but of insulin. insulin goes up. GLP-1 will also sensitize all sorts of cells to become more discerning to insulin. So GLP-1 works by saying, okay, all your cells that need to listen to insulin, so we receptors, you could almost imagine them as big molecular ears, right? GLP-1 will actually increase sensitivity. So all these receptors on cells that are supposed to respond to insulin in terms of insulin, including the uptake of glucose, and also the uptake of amino acids will help. GLP-1 also really promotes satiety. So it makes you feel more full, less hungry. And it also has quite a lot of protective effects in terms of protecting both the cardiovascular system, renal protection, uh, and not both in of the cardiovascular system. It protects both your arteries, but also your heart. It's also... Uh, bone protective, osteoprotective, and also neuroprotective for your brain, right? But he has an SNP that lowers his function of TCF7L2. And so when you have this function in TCF7L2, then you're actually going to produce less GLP-1 than you should, even when you get all the right signals there. Because, I mean, think about it, okay, what, do you, what affects GLP-1? So we put him on a food high in fibrous non-starchy carbs, right? So lots of sort of size distension. Put on a diet high in protein. Protein is supposed to increase GLP-1 release. Uh, and we put in on some carbohydrates, not too many. That's supposed to help with GLP-1 release, right? So I think part of the reason here why he would have type 2 diabetes and respond rather poorly to metformin and insulin or might we have to be really aggressive with both diet, but also with exercise to get his glucose levels into the normal range is probably because he, his endogenous production of GLP-1 is lower than expected, even with the right stimuli and input. And that's why I should say, okay, I would really, for from the pharmaceutical, pharmacological part of this, I'd really love to get him on a GLP-1 agonist um, 
and ideally an oral one because you know this notion that I'd have either every single day or a week or several times a week to jab myself with a pen is you know with semaglutide and lyric lyriglutide it's not really my sort of things so, okay well um so hope so that would be one thing to try to improve management so hopefully at some point his GP will actually agree to give him ribelsis which is an all GLP one agonist. And my experience just from clients in general is that the clients I have, I mean, because I I coach them on lifestyle and nutrition and so forth, but I'm also, if, if patients actually need pharmacological management on the side, I'll speak to that. And sort of an observation, which is not, I mean, you can't say it's hard data, but is that the patients I have with type 2 diabetes who have the SNPs in CCF702 where it lowers function, so they're either heterocycles or homozygotes, they seem to respond a lot better to and a lot have a more potent response to all these GLP-1 agonists. And they also tend to get less nauseated, less constipated. But that would make sense if your own baseline production of GLP-1 in response to meals is lower than it should be, then adding in a medication that kind of works like GLP-1, albeit at sustained signaling, not just on and off and more potent, of course, would make sense because then, and from a pharmacological point of view, you're actually trying to deal with sort of a genetic weakness, right? But as you can see, GLP-1 it really has an impact on many things. Um, also, this notion said, well, when we change when we change his diet to something that should be good for him, he's hungry all the time. Well, if his GLP-1 production is lower than normal, that would help. That would explain why he kept on feeling hungry. Right. Then he also had some an off variant for FTO, fat mass and obesity associated protein. And so the off variants are associated with higher body fat, poor appetite control, dysglycemia, lower energy metabolism. But exercise and physical activity counterbalances these problems, and a more protein rich diet counterbalances these things. And going to go back, look for FTO. He's also a heterozygote, right? And that's the other thing. What? Oh, sorry, going the wrong way here. What will actually do a lot of these things apart from food or pharmaceutical movement, right? And then, and this is a new one. It hasn't been included until I think the end of last year, the beginning of the year, is the insulin receptor substrate one. So IRS one, it's not the Internal Revenue Service. I remember when I spoke to some people in the U.S. Uh, about this, uh, right? Then people were like, oh, no, what? IRS, I'm getting jittery just by you mentioning that, but it's not internal revenue service. So that's insulin receptor substrate one, right? So IRS, one plays a major role in terms of this whole interplay between insulin, hitting the insulin receptor, and then you have signaling from the insulin receptor that leads to the translocation of glucose transporter four to the surface of the cell to allow better glucose uptake. But if you then have IRS1 dysfunction, such as he has, you can see that for one of the SNPs, he's a homozygote, which really lowers functioning. There are two areas where you can have SNPs that alter that, right? Um, but so for one of the SNPs, he also has a major spelling mistake that really interferes. And so that again makes you know me think, why wouldn't he again? Because he, he was given basal insulin and that still didn't work. I mean, it's like, how in the world can you have an issue with basal insulin not working for a patient, even when given in pretty high doses and having making no difference whatsoever to blood glucose levels? And then initially it was like, doesn't make sense that we should also give you. Um, just need to share the right thing here. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So, I mean, how can you explain someone who's given insulin and still has elevated glucose? Well, if it's insulin receptor one. IS-1 is dysfunctional, 
then even his own production of insulin or exogenous insulin isn't really going to do much for GLUT4, right? So you're not going to get GLUT4 translocation to the surface of the cell membrane to allow glucose uptake. And that leaves you with glucose transporter 1 or glucose transporter 2, but also glucose transporter 3. Now, what, what things can you do to upregulate the activity and function of glucose transporter 1, 2, and 3? Movement, right? Movement will really increase functioning there. So when you start looking at his genetics, how is it possible for such a young man who wasn't unhealthy by any means initially to develop type 2 diabetes and be unable to control type 2 diabetes by anything other than being not no carb, but rather aggressively low carb, but also having lots of movement, but distributed throughout the day. But just look at all these dysfunctions you have, right? I mean, he definitely has high carb sensitivity, like extremely high carb sensitivity from a genetic point of view. Uh, also, when we look at some of his other genes, right, um, that look at carb sensitivity, they're not really good either, although these are more looked at in terms of carbs for satiety and sweet things and also um, for blocking fat loss, but he doesn't have a fat issue or body composition issue, right? And then on top of that, there's this gluten sensitivity. So might it also be that part of the reason he has better glucose management when we have him off starchy carbs, because he would eat you know, rye bread, which is super healthy, uh, and it's not like American rye, which is refined wheat flour with a bit of rye, but proper whole grain rye and rye kernels, um, right? Because we could see he has a predisposition for celiac disease as well, right? And he's not celiac. We actually did have his celiac antibodies measured, um, but you can't get cross-reactive antibodies between gliadin and beta cells. Uh, and we know from research that for type 1 diabetes, he doesn't have that, but a gluten-free diet can really extend the honeymoon period, right? Um, and you can have those reactions. So one thing is he on his way to becoming a type 1.5 diabetic, although his persistent normal seed peptide suggests that not, that's not an issue, right? But also, you know, why is it that the only way to manage him is to have him move repeated throughout the day, have him move after every meal, keep him on not a no-carb diet, but a relatively low-carb diet, and still do lots of things with alpha-lipoic acid and other things. And that's the only way to manage his rather aggressive dysglycemia, despite being young, healthy, never having a body composition issue. I mean, probably because of that stacking of genetics that interfere, especially with insulin functioning. I mean, when his TCF7L2 is dysfunctional, then his endogenous production of insulin in response to meals is lower because it produces less GLP-1. And the GLP-1 is also lacking in terms of sensitizing other cells to insulin. And then on top of that, every single cell with an insulin receptor, you're not going to get the full sort of full sensitivity or full response to insulin because of the IRS-1 uh, being him being a homozygote in one of the two hours where you can have these spelling mistakes. Um, so, but you can see, I mean, some in some ways the genetics haven't changed the management, but now he's realized, okay, the, the only way to keep this under control is it's, it's non-negotiable. We're going to have to have the, your lifestyle set up in a way where in the morning you're going to have to bike to work or take your kids to school by manual propulsion. And when you have lunch, you're going to have to go for a walk after lunch, um, right? And in the evening after dinner, you're going to have to go for a walk and then also exercise and stay in good shape. But if you just have one chunk of foundational movement, say in the morning, then he runs elevated blood glucose later in the day, right? Um, but it makes sense because there are all these stacked genetic problems with insulin signaling and you know which also probably explains his 
inability to really have high lean mass because insulin is pretty pretty um, important as well in terms of your ability to build muscle. Right. So 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 especially when you have clients where you're not really having any uh where you, you like they have type two diabetes, they have disc glycemia, you're doing all the normal things. Uh right. Then you probably want to do their genetics and see what's going on, especially to find the right way to treat it. Because here pharmacological management so far has done very little, as you can see with some of these measurements. Uh, Ideally, a GLP-1 agonist, so Wigovi, Saxenda, Ribelsus, Ozempic, any of those, they're the same two drugs, they're the same two constituents. I mean, all the GLP-1 agonists are just liraglutide and semaglutide, so pharmaceutically, that would help us target his genetic weakness. Um, but from a lifestyle perspective, carb reduction and then also um, movement, but not just one chunk. It has to be distributed throughout the day because the only way we can get glucose uptake into his cells after eating, since his GLUT4 seems to be dysfunctional in regards of what we do, is actually to have him move, right? But how, how would you know that unless you actually did the genetics? And so now he's locked in and says, okay, this sort of wearing a bit off or even if the world situation changes so I don't have to bring the kids to school and kindergarten by biking them or biking with them. I'm just going to have to keep on moving and having repeated chunks of movement throughout the day, right? And so it's gotten to the point now where as an accountant, if he's with a customer out on site, right, then he still says, well, when we've had lunch, I'm going to go for a walk half an hour, a brisk walk, I'll be back. I'll do more of your numbers and things like that. I'll look at your finances, help me do your books, run, you know, financial or economic um, analyses and so forth. But you're going to have to allow me to get that movement. Um, and then we have to go. So milk fractions could trigger type 1 diabetes. And it's, but said at the moment, he doesn't seem to be type 1 diabetic because the C-peptide is normal, right? So one way to to see if you actually have, if you still have a proper function of production of insulin is to measure your C-peptide. So C-peptide is the remainder that circulates for way longer after insulin has been created. And then... And one question. So patient was in a CGM. Yep. That's why he have so he has a CGM all the time. And I said the only way that uh, we could see the only thing that would keep his glucose levels in check is half an hour of movement or more post every single meal. Right. And that's why I said, okay, only three meals a day. Um, right. Because if he had to have snacks in between, then he'd have we'd have to add in way more movement which just isn't possible to fit in i mean if you're moving in the morning before you go to work and then you get into movement after lunch and then you get into movement in the evening after dinner train after dinner if you had to have, he was going to have snacks that would then give him these you know glucose elevations as well and he'd have to move after those then he you know you'd have to change his job to being like a, a warden uh you know in in the forest or something like that where he'd just be moving all day long and we also now know that if he's ill, we have to get him back on his feet immediately because the moment he gets a sore throat or anything like that, he will, you know, his glucose levels will go up because he can't move, even though we are being pretty aggressive on his carb intake. And yeah, it is a bit complex but that's i mean that's the thing i mean that it's a complex case but again think of it this way you have a man he has type 2 diabetes and he has pretty severe type 2 diabetes he has no body composition or dietary or lifestyle indication that he would be in that situation and that's why they missed it initially some of the initial signs and symptoms frequent urination urination thirst hunger headaches edema frequent infections, just not feeling well, 
dizziness, right? But like that that sort of body composition, that diet being in pretty good shape, no way. And and then and then again, the only way we can manage it is pure meals, no concentrated carbs. But even doing that, that's not enough to keep him in check. If he's given metformin or given insulin, that doesn't really do that much. But movement, lots of movement. And then we have added all these insulin sensitizers. And then I'd really love to see if we could give him a bit more freedom in terms of not having to move you know, 21 times a week after each main meal uh, and give him a bit more freedom in terms of managing blood glucose levels if we could actually get him on a GLP-1 agonist. So it's like the, questions are coming in, but yeah, they're coming gazillion questions. So uh, especially so and has his eye have they his eyes been tested for glucose damage? Yes, we have had the so we know there's nothing happening with the uh, diabetes, you know, like visual complications with diabetes. Um, and again, and did you see an, an effect from cinnamon? No, that's the thing, even all these natural things, cinnamon and so forth, they seem to improve the potency or the effect of movement right but any so far of the pharmaceutical pharmacological agents not really useful or have very little effect in terms of the doses given and also all the natural things um right and and so people have said what about berberine well if metformin doesn't work berberine certainly wouldn't work either berberine kind of works like metformin but it's not as potent i mean um so I, I wouldn't expect that. Um, but you certainly you can use berberine rather than metformin uh, for patients, especially if they have a you know untowards effects to metformin, if they have side effects from metformin. Uh, and probably one of the reasons why berberine also helps improve glucose handling is because it seems to increase the growth of acamantium mucinifila, so that one of these new darlings in the gut microbiota when it's in your small intestine, the lower small intestine, it will actually increase signaling that ups your in the own production of GLP-1. Right. Uh, so we have that. And what more questions do we have? So, so Pankos said, what's the outcome? Well, so the outcome is at the moment we can manage him, but we can only manage him by three meals a day, no, no starch, lean protein, movement, three times a day and training every day on top of that. And then we give him all these insulin sensitizers, all these accessory things that should help him regulate blood glucose. When we do that, we can actually keep him in the normal range. But the moment we get just a little bit sidetracked with starches, even from super healthy things like legumes, or the moment we don't have a move in the morning before or after breakfast, midday, after lunch, and before and after dinner, then things just go anywhere from a bit off to completely sideways. But I'm quite sure it's the genetics, because we look at the genetics, they're just stacked for poor insulin functioning. And that's also why he, because you know, normally insulin added as part of the pharmacological management of type two diabetes would be for an elderly, weak, obese person who also starts showing signs of pancreatic burnout. But there's none of that here either. And there's a question, is there a long-term impact of being on semaglutide in the short term and then coming off? Um, well, I mean, there is the side effect if semaglutide or lyraglutide work either for type 2 diabetes or for obesity management. We know from the studies that people who go off these GLP-1 agonists, not all, but quite a few will regain a lot or all of the body weight they lost. There are some people who you're able to use it GLP-1 agonist along with exercise and diet. And then if you have them on a really good program of exercise and diet, that seems to be, enable them to maintain weight loss and maintain the same calorie intake, the same dietary sort of um, overall pattern after they come off semaglutide or lyraglutide. But there are other people where when they come off, then their appetite gets the better of them again. Uh, right. And then and, and Ilya said, what about the mercury overload? Could be significant as well, but that's why, I mean, we're going to go back and retest that, but now we have him on alpha-lipoic acid, NAC and chlorella, but it's going to, I mean, 
these we're going to retest for the mercury sometime late fall this year um, right so then we've had about half a year of doing sort of some mild chelation because it could have an impact we don't know uh, that could also on top of the genetics and that's the one thing that was off right so that could be and then how about regular insulin post meals well they actually did try that a few times but it didn't make any difference really so that's the i didn't, I didn't put notice that but they they but they tried post meal insulin as well and it just made a slight dent i mean so we have measurements on him where we have a cgm where post meal insulin it brings it down a bit but then movement for 30 40 minutes brisk walk biking or a workout boom and he will not get too high and we'll get he straight back in the ideal range. And for Afifa, is he still hungry and tired? Less so. Uh, but also now I think because we put him on some iron, because he seemed to be maybe not anemic, but he's certainly lower than ideal on iron, which you know, so so that seems to help some um, with the iron being added. Time is running up a little bit, but yeah. there's there's there seem to be like some some questions like what's the mechanism of action of uh, both the berberine and uh, also the acamantia for that matter, and how berberine could impact acamantia, and yeah. perhaps even back to the inositol after because there's people are, there's some out here who's also confused, um, so maybe it would if possible just to go a little oh. over time and just maybe go through the mechanisms of actions on those three and oh, well. then and we'll yeah. cut it off <laughs> yeah, otherwise you'll have to come to london for exactly. more or and confusion in <laughs> so, was yeah. it keep calm london is coming <laughs> yeah. so okay so the the link with akamansha is okay so we know that there are all sorts of signals in your small intestine that can increase the production of your own production of GLP-1, right? So signals like stretch, as I said, like protein, sweet molecules being present, but not until you get into uh, past the duodenum in your small intestine. Uh, also things that taste bitter have that effect but something that also seems to have that effect is acamantia with sinifila so we just call it am when it's present in the lower small intestine that actually signals the small intestine to produce glp1 so if we can up acamantia then that will enhance our endogenous production of glp1 now for him it might not work as well because he still has lower function of tcf7 l2 so his own ability to produce glp1 is reduced but we think in general right um and then when you get GLP-1, that has all those effects. And one of the effects of berberine is actually, it seems to be a not just an antimicrobial, but also a selective prebiotics of berberine ups the growth of acamantia mucinophilia. And thereby, so one of the ways by which berberine works is probably not just by changing glucose handling directly absorption from the gut or glucose handling at the cell level and mitochondrial level, but also that berberine in general, when you ingest it, it tends to up acamantia mucinophila, which will then up GLP-1. Unless, of course, you have a tcf 7 l 2 dysfunction, in which case that pathway is probably not going to be that effective. And then we had with the inositol. So we know that we can actually go back and moment, use the insulin so receptor diagram but did they... so once insulin hits the insulin receptor right then we need a intracellular signal that eventually will lead to the translocation of glucose transporter for from the inside of the cell to the surface and open up a really potent high throughput portal for bringing glucose in. Part of that intracellular signaling is an inositol-based compound. So you need inositol to make 
one of the messenger molecules that will be released after the insulin receptor has been stimulated to then say, yo, get GLUT4 to the surface. And that's why it's worth trying with inositol in people who have insulin resistance and dysglycemia. Normally, we'd think of inositol for PCOS, right? And for PCOS, because PCOS, there's a strong component with insulin resistance, dysglycemia, and so forth, right? So women with PCOS who are given inositol also get improvement of their insulin resistance. Why is that? Because it generally improves the functioning of insulin. Because if you don't have enough inositol, then this messenger molecule, after you hit the insulin receptor, won't be made in sufficient amounts. So that's the reason why it's worth trying inositol. But then again, why wouldn't inositol make that much of a difference for him? Well, because if his insulin receptor subunit one is knocked out, then the thing that will lead to the formation of inositol-based messengers still isn't working. So even if we give him inositol, that's not, not going to upregulate PI3K, right? But provided you don't have an insulin receptor dysfunction due to your genetics, then giving inositol really should upregulate. And I see that. So in general, in type 2 diabetes, we don't have this sort of very particular genetic burden and almost multiple genes stacked on top of one another, hitting one specific pathway in glucose management. And here with insulin functioning, um, both production sensitivity and intracellular functioning, then you should try inositol for your patients with type 2 diabetes, not just for women with PCOS and insulin resistance. That. Super. Let's call it a night yeah. now. <laughs> and uh, I can see many of you were impressed and learned a lot, as did I. And yeah, as we did said a little bit, this was um, a teaser for the London upcoming event. So hopefully you become very hungry for meeting Umao in London and spending time with us uh, at the end of April month. So we will, of course, send details out and you already have some in your entry. So and please reach out if you have any questions or anything or want to do more education. The recording of today will be sent out and shared with all of you and also uh, the, the slides that Umao prepared for the lecture will be shared with you, but the drawings, they are in the video. <laughs> so uh, Umao, big hugs from here and uh, thank you very much for a sterling presentation. And thank you out there for staying tuned um, and like being glued to your screens. See you out there and uh, take care everyone. Bye. If you do not already have an account with us, please contact our team and we will assist you. If you found this webinar helpful, please like and subscribe to our channel.